Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. It's time to talk about some cool animals that people think of as dinosaurs, but that aren't. This time it's the menacing monsters of the Mesozoic skies, pterosaurs. You may know them as pterodactyls, and as far as I'm concerned, that's a perfectly fine name for them. No one's going to come up to you and tell you that, actually, tigers, house cats, and lions aren't cats, they're phyllids. Technical terms are good for science, but if you're just talking casually, common names are fine. And so pterodactyl is a common name for pterosaurs. That being said, I use the term pterosaurs most of the time, and this being intended as an educational video, I'm going to use it here. Okay, what is a pterosaur? Well, I think most people can recognize them pretty easily. They are those reptiles with the big wings supported by a single finger and made primarily of what seems like skin. They often have head crests and otherwise gigantic heads. Unfortunately, they are often badly portrayed in film and other media, acting like eagles, picking things up with their feet, which they could not, and being portrayed as naked or leathery, or even scaly even though they were really quite fluffy. That's all well and good, but what makes them not dinosaurs? Well, in this case we can't look at the ankles like we did with crocodilians, and more broadly with the pseudosuchians. The reason is that both pterosaurs and dinosaurs are avometatarsalians, but we can look at some other features of pterosaur anatomy. Pterosaurs have closed acetabula, rather than the open ring of bone characteristic of dinosaurs. They also have a special bone that no other animals have, the prepubis. It is an unpaired bone anterior to the anteroventral margin of the pubis. Another unique bone is the pteroid bone. It's not clear if this is a modified carpal bone, a sesamoid bone, or if it is not homologous to any other bones at all. It was used to support the propatagium, that part of the wing stretching between the wrist and the shoulder. Of course, perhaps the most obvious trait pterosaurs have that dinosaurs lack is the wing finger. This is a hugely enlarged digit 4, that is the ring finger although sometimes it is described as being the animal's pinky finger because it's the last finger they have, having lost digit 5 long before the first known pterosaurs, and probably before they ever started evolving flight. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, but they are very closely related to them. In fact, the bones of pterosaurs, like dinosaurs, have framina used to allow air sacs into them. In fact, pterosaur bones were so pneumatic that by volume they were almost all air. This also strongly implies a flow-through lung like those of modern birds. In this system, the lungs are rigid and air sacs push air into the lungs and then back out the trachea, so the air entering the lungs is always fresh and not mixed with already breathed air. This made for a very efficient oxygen supply system and is probably a big factor in both birds and pterosaurs being so well adapted for flight. Another bird-like trait is that pterosaurs had a gizzard and a stomach. For a long time this was only conjecture, but in 2009 a specimen of pterodastro was found with preserved gastroliths, confirming that pterosaurs had bird-like stomachs. Gastroliths are small stones swallowed to aid in digestion and are stored in the gizzard. One interesting thing about pterosaurs is that it seems that none of them were herbivores, with one possible exception. It seems that all of them ate animals, whether fish, crustaceans, insects, lizards, or even dinosaurs. This is speculation, but it may be that their small torsos did not lend them to having large enough guts to effectively digest plant matter. Broadly speaking, pterosaurs fall into two groups, the basal rampharynchoids and the more derived pterodactyloids. While pterodactyloidea is probably a valid taxon, being monophyletic, there are some rampharynchoid pterosaurs more closely related to pterodactyloids than they are to some other rampharynchoid groups. This means that rampharynchoids are an evolutionary grade rather than a clade, and so are not a valid taxon. Rampharynchoid pterosaurs are characterized by long tails, toothy jaws, and separate nares and antorbital fenestrae. They were also less prone to having large head crests, some of the more basal members of the group also had a large big toe that seemed to support a wing membrane that may or may not have incorporated the tail. Pterodactyloid pterosaurs have short tails, usually have lost their big toe, and in many cases their nares and antorbital fenestrae have joined into one opening in the skull, sometimes with a strut of bone projecting down from the top of the opening, but not reaching the ventral portion of the fenestra. Pterodactyloids are often toothless, although this is not always the case. Let's look at some notable groups of pterosaurs. First up, we have the tiny and, frankly, adorable aneurygnathids, characterized by aneurygnathus. These big-eyed fuzzballs were probably nocturnal insectivores. Basically, they are reptilian bats from the Jurassic. Unfortunately, we have few fossils of these little guys because they seem to have inhabited forests, and being small and forest-dwelling is a great way to not leave behind many fossils. It's one of the reasons that, while fossil remains of human ancestors are relatively common after Africa started to dry out and the forest shrank, 
Prior to that, African hominoid fossils are basically unknown. Ramphorhynchids should not be confused with ramphorhynchoids, because while ramphorhynchids are ramphorhynchoids, many ramphorhynchoids are not ramphorhynchids. This basal family of toothy, long-tailed pterosaurs includes such polster children as Sordes pelosus, one of the pterosaurs that made it clear that they were fluffy, and Ramphorhynchus wensteri, one of the first known pterosaurs and the star of a segment of the BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs. These pterosaurs probably lacked the brain power to use dynamic yaw stabilization like more derived pterosaurs and modern birds. Instead, their long tails ended in rudders that pushed the center of lift far back, making them inherently stable, but at the cost of some degree of agility. These were not aerial acrobats. Ornithochirids are a family of pterodactyloids with flashy jaws filled with tiny teeth. They are among the best known and described pterosaurs in the current literature. Their time on Earth stretched across some 55 million years of the Cretaceous, from about 140 to 93 million years ago. That being said, working out ornithochirid systematics has been hugely complicated, and it is still very much up in the air. Ornithochirids had very long jaws, and most, but not all, had crests on the anterior end of these jaws. They also develop a plate of bone over the neural spines of the sacral vertebrae, somewhat like the notarium common in pterosaurs over the anterior dorsal vertebrae. One reason that ornithochirid remains are found in so many places is that they were probably seagoing animals, perhaps wading around in water like toothy waterfowl. Of course, the standout and titular example of this family is Ornithochirus simus. Now we come to one of the most instantly recognizable groups of pterosaurs, the Pteranodontians, including the famous Pteranodon longiceps and Pteranodon sternbergi. These animals are well known from the American Western Interior Seaway of the late Cretaceous, and many of their remains are found in the interior of the United States of America. That being said, at least one genus is known from Europe, and given their immense size and likely ability to fly long distances, it's not surprising they were a bit more cosmopolitan than early finds would suggest. These are the classic short-tailed, no-big-toe, no-teeth pterodactyloids, that perhaps unfairly are the ultimate example of that group. Interestingly, both species of pteranodon have morphs with large and small crests. It is presumed, but cannot be shown for sure, that the large-crested individuals were male and the short-crested ones female. Besides pteranodon, another famous genus of pteranodontian is Nyctosaurus, with its ludicrously large crest, comically longer than the rest of its body put together. Tepaharidae, spelled with a J and not an H, are a group of pterodactyloid pterosaurs first discovered in South America, but now are known from Eastern Asia, Europe, and North Africa. They had toothless beaks, large fan-shaped crests, and are known primarily from terrestrial environments. Seemingly unique among pterosaurs, tapaharids may have gotten some significant amount of their calorie intake from fruit. This is based on the shape and details of their jaw. That being said, however, it is likely that meat was still a vital part of their diet, especially given their small torsos and short guts. Typical of pterosaurs. Famous members of this group include Tupendactylus imperator and Tapahara Welnhoferi. Last, but far from least, we come to the giants of the Cretaceous skies, the Ashdarkids. Ashdarkids probably represent the largest animals to ever fly, and also the last pterosaur group in existence. They lived right up until the end of the Mesozoic. These toothless, long-necked animals probably fed like modern storks, but on land rather than primarily over the water. Their heads were longer than a human is tall, and the largest could have looked a giraffe in the eyes. The most famous members are certainly Quetzalcoatlus of the Americas and the European Hatsagopteryx, two closely related genera from opposite sides of the then smaller Atlantic. Well, that doesn't even come close to covering all the pterosaur groups that are known to science. There are also Campylonathoidids, Wokongopterids, Istiodactylids, Poreopterids, Tenochasmatoidians, Dusungaripteroids, Loncodectids, Kyongopterids, and Thalassodromids, each unique and interesting in their own way. If you want to learn about all of these, I suggest getting a copy of Pterosaurs by Mark P. Witten. One word of warning, though, is that the book is from about seven years ago, so there are some errors early on regarding Archosaur systematics. So take the cladistics in the first few chapters with a grain of salt. Not because Witten was mistaken, but because new and better data have caused a few changes in that area of science. While pterosaurs are not really much of a topic for creationists, except for the occasional overlap between supposed pterosaur cryptids and creationist fantasies about such animals somehow disproving evolution, pterosaurs have their own dedicated pseudoscientist. David Peters is an admittedly talented paleoartist, and if you were a child interested in dinosaurs in the 1990s, chances are that you have seen his artwork. Unfortunately, for the last two decades, he has been falling farther and farther away from science. He has two websites, The Pterosaur Heresies and Reptile Evolution, where he makes outlandish claims about pterosaurs and other reptiles based almost entirely on applying Photoshop filters to low-quality images of fossils, 
and then deciding that things that don't exist are important parts of anatomy. This technique is obviously subjective, and his conclusions are not confirmed by known techniques such as CT scanning or UV light inspection of the same fossils. Unfortunately, for some reason, the Google gods seem to love Peter's work, and his work features prominently in any search results for the organisms he has described. This leaves us in the situation that if you are looking for a good description or skeletal reconstruction of an organism, you need to check the source before you decide to accept it. If it's a Peter's reconstruction, then it is suspect, especially the soft tissue outlines. Peter's thinks pterosaurs are lizards, and that dinosaurs are more closely related to mammals than they are to lizards. He is also known for being extremely vitriolic in response to criticism, no matter how valid. Well, that's it for this episode of Things That Aren't Dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are some of my favorite non-dinosaurs, and I really do encourage you to check out the book by Mark P. Witten. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and share it. If you haven't yet subscribed, then go ahead and do so, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons. Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Bob Knob, The Evil Scotsman, Henry Hutanen, Chris Love, and Res Instance. My team over at Patreon are helping me make these videos, and I have tiers starting as low as a dollar and going all the way up to $100. So if you'd like to help out the Dapper Dino channel and help make these videos better and possibly even more frequent, then why don't you head over there and check it out? If a recurring donation isn't right for you, but you'd still like to help out, I have a link to my Amazon wishlist in the description. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.